so uh, I'm going to kick things off and take you on a journey that starts with a chest tube and ends like Paul uh, talked about how the uh, function of that chest tube can impact not only complications, but cost. Um, and then after I get things started, we've got uh, Dr. Gilanoff and Dr. Perot who will be uh, uh, contributing to that as well. So we all know that every patient after heart surgery requires a chest tube. Uh, you basically can't work inside the chest uh, operatively without uh, draining any blood or fluid that, that, that uh, results. And we know that they all require, but the big question that we came up with was do they always work? Uh, because my impression was that sometimes we would take patients to the operating room uh, after an operation because there was fluid around their heart or fluid around their lung or blood or a take back. And I'd look at the chest tubes and they'd be clogged. And I think to myself, listen, if a patient is still bleeding, that chest tube better be open. And if that chest tube's not open and they're still bleeding, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to remain somewhere and it's going to be around the heart or the lungs. And that can impact their outcomes. So when we first started talking to folks about this, people would say, yeah, that happens, but I'm not so sure how often that happens. And so I teamed up with uh, Dr. Gilanoff and his team at the Cleveland Clinic, and, and they did a study, uh, a prospective observational study, working with the ICU nurses at the Cleveland Clinic. And they were able to observe that 36% of chest tubes have evidence of clogging, complete clogging, in the first 24 hours after heart surgery. And that was a bit of a surprise because we knew, we'd actually done a, a published survey talking to people about clogging and everybody said, yeah, I see it, I just don't know how often it happens. Well, this is the first time we were able to quantify that, that it happened you know, in almost four out of 10 patients. And what was interesting is, is mostly the clogging was on the inside. The nurses might be able to pinch or squeeze or even strip the chest tubes and get it all clear up to the skin level. But where that clogging was, was on the inside, the business end of the chest tube where the drainage holes were, and it often went unnoticed by the care providers at the bedside. So we started thinking, well, how can we study the, the, the clinical result of this? Yes, chest tube clogging is a chest tube problem. It's not a patient problem. What's the patient problem? So we said, well, maybe it's a take back for bleeding, or maybe it's a bloody effusion, or maybe it's a bloody uh, 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 fluid around the lung or heart. And so we ended up uh, putting together a working group to study this. And we came up with the term re retained blood syndrome to kind of encompass at a composite level several different things that can happen if your chest tube clogs. And then again, the next question was, well, then how often does that happen? And, and again, how does chest tube clogging re result in retained blood? So this is kind of a schematic of that. At the top is an open chest tube that's draining great. So what happens, it sits in that uh, mediastinal space or the pearl space, and it sucks it down, and the blood comes out. But if that tube occludes, blood is going to build up around that chest tube. And then even if you reopen the chest tube later with a suction catheter, you've still got this big clot of blood that can't make it to the chest tube. And so keeping that chest tube open, we hypothesized, was going to be the way to get all that blood out of there so it doesn't have a time to accumulate and um, cause problems. And then when we looked at retained blood syndrome, we said, well, this is something that might happen acutely in the first few hours. And that's what everybody thinks about. The take back for bleeding is very dramatic. Everyone notices. But what about the subacute, the patient that goes home and ends up with a, a chest uh, half full of blood? Or the patient that has blood around their, their heart, and they may not know it, but they're just not feeling good and recovering as quickly as, as you would like. And then obviously, we've got famous cases like Bill Clinton, who after his operation ultimately had to go back for a decortication because he had a big fibrous peel around his lung. And that happens as well. So this is something that might manifest acutely and get noticed, subacutely or chronically. And trying to pull all that together was the intent behind this term, retained blood syndrome. And the nice thing about it is it's easy to measure what a hospital's rate, because if you define it as an intervention to go back in and remove blood, blood clot, or bloody fluid after a heart operation, then there's codes for that. There's ICD-9, ICD-10, CPT codes. And we started going to hospitals and saying, hey, would you look at these codes? And pretty consistently, it was kind of like one out of five to one out of six patients, or anywhere between 15 and 20%. And then we looked at the national data, a, a sample of over 300,000 patients in the United States. Again, we could see it. So this was something that we recognized. This happens a lot more than, than we thought. And then we started asking, OK, what are the outcomes for the patients that end up with retained blood? And this is a paper that was in the August uh, edition this last month of the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. And this was from a, a cohort of 7,000 patients, of which 20% had retained blood and the other did not. 
And um, that group, which I think this was presented at this meeting last year by Dr. Balzer, showed that mortality was up 106%, significantly longer ICU times. And we hear from a lot of programs that sometimes the ICU becomes a, a bottleneck and you have to slow down your OR until you can get some people out of the ICU. So, so longer ICU times, higher rates of post-op AFib. And we also saw that in the chest tube clogging study from the Cleveland Clinic. Higher rate of chest tube of AFib with the chest tube clogging or with the retained blood. Long, more kidney injury, uh, increased infection. And then we did another study where we looked at how much this cost. And in the United States, <laughs> when a patient has retained blood, it increases their, their cost of care by $28,000 which is significant. And so, and, and it was very similar in Europe as well. So if you take, you know, a uh, hundred patients and 17 of them get this, that's almost a half million dollars. If you're doing a thousand cases a year, that's a five million dollar a year problem. So now we've kind of learned that here you have this, this problem, chest tube clogging, which can cause these recognizable and measurable uh, clinical events like a tamponade, a hemothorax, a bloody effusion. And then after that happens, you layer on these secondary complications like kidney issue, post-op AFib, stroke, delirium, mortality, infection. And ultimately, that ripples out to consequences at the cost level and also at the throughput level for the ICUs and the hospitals that are trying to get people in and out in an efficient way. So here's this little problem, chest tube clogging, has this ripple effect that impacts the bottom line at the hospital and also all of your jobs just trying to take care of these patients every week. And in the last month's Journal of Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery, some surgeons from Europe were asked to do a uh, editorial on this subject. And they wrote that, you know, Surgeons really should kind of keep in mind that, especially when we're starting to compare things like AFib surgery versus AFib ablation or mitral valve percutaneous versus mitral valve open or robotic, that even these little complications like an effusion, like an AFib, like a take back, can really influence whether we even get to do these operations in the future. And so even what we consider to be sort of mild nuisances uh, actually can have a big impact uh, that goes way beyond just a clogged chest tube. Now, when I got this company started, I ended up teaming up with Dr. Gilanoff very early, and he introduced me to Dr. Perot and some of the others, and we've had a working group working on this, and we've been very lucky to get some excellent studies going in some of the top places in the world. And um, Dr. Gilanoff's gonna pick it up from here and kind of talk about the product, Pluriflow, that was developed to address this problem and some of the outcomes from using that in terms of reducing complications. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we've seen some really interesting stuff that by preventing chest tube clogging, you might be able to reduce post-operative atrial fib, fibrillation, something that all of you see every day. And Dr. Perot is gonna talk about some of the work he and his colleagues have done on post-operative atrial fibrillation, both in the lab and clinically. Um, so I'll uh, hand it over to Dr. Gilanoff uh, next. <laughs> 